Welcome to another episode of the Silver Eye Society. We're back. We're going to cover yet another war movie. Lots of war movies. I'm exhausted. But I think it's important because we don't have wars on our soil. And the wars we fight now are so out of our view. And they are covered by the press entirely differently. And maybe that's what contributes to the sense that war is just this thing in the background that we do now used to be a much bigger deal and it is a much bigger deal in places that don't have such strict methods for covering war but we'll get into the the media of the war shortly let me introduce the movie that helps full metal jacket another kubrick kubrick as you like movie this one is i don't you know as i was watching this movie there was a lot of moments of cringe you know like we don't say that anymore and ooh, this is very of its time and but the thing is it's not of the movie's time it's of the time the movie is depicting so the vietnam war what is this like i think it's the movie takes place in the 60s or the 70s would you like me to chime in on that that was a question directed towards you. You are so oh, was resentful it? of not being able to run through the gates and start with the pod- the word of the podcast every time. <laughs> the word of the podcast. Stick. The word of the podcast is where it begins. But uh, yeah, so this it's is... It's not though. It's literally not. Well, in the minds of viewers and all people of uh, good and righteous uh, heart, they know that the real beginning is the word of the podcast. Here's the thing. They so totally uh, obviously it starts in training camp. Who knows when that was? But... The Tet Offensive was 1968, so this would have been 1968, because the main second half of the movie is in the city of Hue during the Tet Offensive, 1968. Roughly the beginning of the year, it's uh, it's based on Vietnamese New Year, which is a little mm, bit different right. than our New Year. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, before you um, carry on with the word of the podcast, as you like to do, Let's introduce some of the themes that we're going to cover in this episode or that we're going to try to get to. It's always a possibility that it's two parts. So the media, the media and how coverage of wars has changed drastically and in a weird way, too, because the thing is, we don't even care. And that's one of the strangest things when freedom is reduced over the period of many generations is that generations later, people don't even realize the freedoms that they lack. And we're going to go into um, the, the military and war as kind of a manifestation of the idea of chaos versus order. Because, of course, it's very clear to see that war, the side of the military, is very orderly. But at the actual battle is the epitome of chaos. And Pyle, the, the, very, um, the, the first part of the movie that's very horror-like, I think is a very chaotic character. And so there's the idea of death. There's the ideas of um, de-individuation, all that good stuff that comes along with war. Now, go ahead. Oh, you give me the, uh, you give me the right the to give the word of the podcast. Great. That's right. So today the word of the podcast is brainwashing. An attempt to alter or control the thoughts and beliefs of another person against his will by psychological techniques. 1950. This word only uh, came around in English around 1950. A literal translation of the Chinese, she now. I don't speak Chinese, so who knows what the intonation is, but she now. A term from the Korean War. Now, the thing about direct translations, because I think this is a word-for-word translation, by understanding is they can be a little bit um, not not great. But uh, so I think that it's a bit of a complicated word. Actually, going into this word, finding this word for the word of the podcast has made me want to explore this a little bit more in depth. And uh, hopefully in the future, I think we'll be covering some other films that deal with this brainwashing idea because it was very popular in the 50s and 60s. And it actually... It actually had real world consequences in terms of the military adopting and or expanding some of these programs 
that were meant to fortify soldiers once they had been captured by the enemy. And there's a lot of, we won't go into that now because it'll be something for another episode. There's a lot that I found uh, interesting about this. So for now, we'll, we'll uh, just stick with the word of the podcast is brainwashing. And it is what my co-host tries to do to all of you when she tries to uh, power play over the word of the podcast. But I she fails. Never. Like all, like all communists, she fails. I- <laughs> Ultimately. I would never, first of all, brainwash my listeners or whatever, because the truth is that I don't care. That's one of the things that is truly a strength in life is that you don't really, it doesn't really bother you when people think different things when you don't care. That's something everybody can adopt. I would try to brainwash you with the ability to care less about the right things, you know, like other people's thoughts. I did write a newsletter about brainwashing, actually, because it's a funny idea because it, it, it always comes up around politics because people always say that the opponent of their ideas is brainwashed, which I think is a boring cop out that anybody that disagrees with you, of course, is not using their brain or is somehow being controlled by some greater malevolent force. And it's like, well, actually, maybe they have reasons as an individual that they came to believe the things that they do just as you did. So brainwashing is uh, it was pretty it was used by the mil- different militaries the chinese definitely and um the the, the well, US military let's 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 they tried uh, to do studies on it they did research into seeing whether it was a real thing or not but it's not right well i mean we probably don't want to delve into this much right now but it it uh, well i mean it, it does have to do with the movie but you, we're, we're it's kinda... your word of the podcast the word of the podcast is a beginning <laughs> you 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 don't listen to this propaganda it is a beginning point <laughs> for others to use to explore to explore etymology well, to explore history right now. i know but we're going to go down we're going to have three parts of this podcast because the, the idea was that brainwashing occurred in particular during the korean war and there was a lot of there's actually a lot of dispute about, especially in the 50s and the 60s in America, brainwashing became almost a kind of uh, thing that, that got into pop culture and science fiction and that kind of stuff and was a, a little bit away from what actually probably happened. Uh, it, some people say that essentially what happened was soldiers were basically low level tortured mm. and of that isn't necessarily brainwashing. They were saying these people were low-level tortured, which then made them say what they were told to say. That's not then, but this this got expanded out to these other concepts of like, and and this is where it gets really squirrely, and it's going to be really interesting to explore in future episodes because the American military started to study these techniques, and this goes into all this stuff with the use of psychedelics in the military, which they did do, trying to understand these processes, and a lot of it is not ended up just causing a lot of destruction and chaos and weren't wasn't really real probably Even but manson. again this is related to manson we gotta be but that's we gotta we gotta be clear and honest and direct and say what it is that we know even if it's complicated and reaches too far into too many things for one episode this brainwashing we're gonna get there we're getting there we're slowly making our way to the larger themes of this episode but um I think brainwashing is a if if people wanted to know more because we're not covering that idea in this episode, um, the newsletter. I don't know what it's called. I just search for brainwashing, I guess, in my newsletter. And because what I actually found out about it was, yeah, there was all these uh, efforts done to really brainwashing, at least for the American military, was uh, in the hopes that you could make it so that um, people would on uh, one goal was to make it so that people would become these almost blank slate killing machines so that you could have a person do an action but then forget that they did the action and, and that's um, f- that that turns out to be kind of fiction it looks yeah. like yeah it looks like that's fiction because it was based on a behaviorist model of psychology and so again, you want to do a? Do we want to do a, a, a? Number one, can you please tell people what your newsletter is called? I'll oh. help you with promotion. Well, I mean, since it is if, the newsletter, if they're it, on this, they called? should know. But it's the weird and good newsletter. But it's not like anybody's going to be able to spell good, like G U with an umlaut D. Just go to my things, and you'll find it. And then you can t- search on Substack on Substack. Um, 
brainwashing. Because what I thought was interesting about brainwashing... You're the person in charge of promotion for this podcast. I just don't I promote just w- myself well, you know? Yeah, you're doing great. Dude, I, I look, this looks like a bright and shining future for you know, us. I just, just go search a thing. Know. It's a word that has an umlaut in it. You can't find it, and I'm not going <laughs> to name it. Blah, blah, blah. All right, what do we got? Themes. Well, hold Themes. It. Okay. Brainwash the audience more. Hold it. Because the thing about brainwashing is that it requires the idea that there is a way that you can break the person down into no personality, into there being nothing there so that you could change a person and just through these different actions of like brainwashing. But the problem is that, and this is what every military finds, is that people are individuals. They have predispensed predispensities to or i don't even know if that's a word predispositions <laughs> nice good job predispositions to certain ideas or certain actions they have personalities and so individuality is what is the obstacle to brainwashing it's really interesting um and people have tried so that's my two cents on your word of the podcast Good. You're welcome to interact with the word of the podcast. Oh, I'm glad I, you're coming I thought I wasn't. No, I'm glad you're coming around instead of opposing it so much. I don't oppose it. Anyway, let's go on to the next. Let's go on to the next theme, which is the role of the media. Now, I just want to I just want to briefly. OK, there's there's some things with this movie. Look. This movie. Is a could could this movie be canceled? Could this movie be censored? Because think about it. This movie is full of racial slurs. This movie is full of uh, like sexism and racism and all that. I mean, obviously, the idea is to depict it as it occurred. But we're in a place now where Disney features a notification before you watch a movie that says this movie contains offensive images. And it's like a movie from the 1950s, which is, you know, use your, your, your we'll be fine. We've made it this far. We're not going to watch, you know, uh, the Jungle Book and start hunting down natives or something. Like, relax. The guy's not even native. Whatever. We're canceled. (laughs) But anyway, the point is that I just think that can we watch this movie? How did you find watching this movie? Because I cringed a little bit. Like, every time it would get to these parts that where there was so many, like, racial slurs and it was like... I know that it's on purpose, but it's a, it's an interesting thing because we are we are in this point of our culture where it actually makes us uncomfortable to know that these things even existed to the point that it's like weird for us to to watch them and we want to put like news dis- disclaimers before. I think it's a sign of weakness personally because we should be able to know that yeah, that's how people spoke during that time and yeah, there was um uh, like the the part where they have the girl that's like um me love you long time like that whole thing that's very offensive by today's standards but the thing is it happened it happened so what do we do here do we say don't show that thing that absolutely happened because i don't like it and it's bad or do we return to a point because that it is it already happened where we can watch movies like this and say yep that's how it was are you what are you asking me that i am afraid you, that the full metal jackets can be canceled here's the thing no i'm not afraid of that and no i'm a, i'm an adult what, what am i i'm like i'm watching a movie and the words are making me feel uncomfortable no i of course not i'm a fucking adult Anyone who thinks it's a child, I know, I, I, don't, I know, so but there I, I don't are know what so to tell many you children that are in charge yeah, of everything now. I'm no longer going to humor that. If if you want to be an adult, be an adult, watch a film. It's got an R rating. If you feel like your yeah. mind is under 17 years old, then go home. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you anymore. I, See, I, you I'm not gonna, like, what do you want me to do? Go, yes. <laughs> but then you do the same thing. You say go home. No, I, it's not, it's not being an asshole. It's being an adult human being. I'm not, it's not, I'm not going to, the thing that, the thing that annoys me is worrying about someone's, someone's feelings on Twitter that I don't know. I don't care. It, yeah. it, this needs to stop. This whole, this, even, even the entering into the dialogue with people like that is, is letting them win. Would I have a debate with a baby? 
<laughs> would I sit on stage and, and, and talk reasonably to a baby? No, of course not. No, I'm not going to do that. And, and would I would I have to like defend why I won't have dialogue with that person? No, I'm not. <laughs> it's done. I'm not. I'm not. I don't. Yeah, Disney wants to put warnings. I don't give a fuck. They don't. It's not like they make anything good. All they do is uh, they just. They used to. No. Now they make propaganda where it's like women can do anything. It's well, like, they, what I they mean, also yeah, whatever, do but is this they. The story is boring. They also, because they're a gigantic <laughs> corporation. Go there. They also. Go where? It's, it's, go it's, there. It's a fa- yeah, they censor things that are offensive to communist Chinese <laughs> uh, interests to make money. Yes. These people are not worthy of debate. I. I it's we, the problem like, is that I, I don't know, <laughs> there is no problem a, I ag- it's silly <laughs> I agree with you I agree with you you say this but then you know there is I think the problem is that so remember when there was like the moral majority and it was the religious right that was trying to get video games and movies and music censored and taken down and placed with with ratings and taken out of uh, you know shop windows so the children walking by wouldn't see it and things like that. And yeah, I do remember because yeah. I'm old enough to remember, and that's why right now and I, I oppose that then and I oppose the, these other fools now. But it doesn't matter problem. to me what side of the political spectrum they're on. It yeah, does not yeah, matter yeah. to me. Because I have a principle. The principle is free speech. Yes, I, I agree. hold to that That's principle, how it is for regardless. Me too. Good. But here's the problem: is that the moral majority and the religious right were boring. They did not <laughs> have the cultural power. So no, here no, 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 no. We have. You're wrong. You're wrong. I now you're getting me all worked up. I don't want These people are boring too. Do, how many more lectures do you want to hear about if the Jungle Book is racist? Is that interesting to you? Are you interested in that? Do you want to have an interesting dialogue on Twitter about that? No, no, no. They're boring. <laughs> They're just as boring as these these these. I crazy agree. I mean, we're all saying the same like, thing. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it has to stop. It can't but be. There's a weird thing here because it's coming out of the cultural elite. It's coming out of the universities. It's coming out of the arts. These are the art students that are now saying all this stuff. So it's like they, it holds a different degree of uh, of sway in the culture when the people that are supposed to be at the forefront of the culture are the ones trying to censor it and hold it back. Now, here's the thing. A new culture emerges. That's what this offensive ass podcast is. If I may say so myself, this is what true artists do they say what the fuck they want and they critique shit and they don't cow and bow towards any one giant narrative or ideology i mean that's what true artists always have done they are at the front of things they are inherently offensive because they are ahead of the culture so i mean if you get into a a a place where the people that were once the arbiters of culture and the people that hold the credentials as being the arbiters of culture. They are the professors. They are the MFA students. They are uh, the editors at publications. These are the people that are telling you now what culture should be. But by its very nature, anyone that tells you what culture should be and is trying to block and censor and and, and denigrate everything into something that uh, is offensive... Well, they've lost the they've lost the claim to being any type of cultural heavyweight. I mean, at that point, you are in the same boat as the moral majority and the right, the religious right. And you guys can have fun censoring Metallica and then taking turns censoring the Jungle Book together. Enjoy. While the rest of us watch Full Metal Jacket. So very good. That's that's where my stance is, too. But it's just interesting because you have to remember that I am of. I am younger than you, and I am more online, sure. terminally online, and I am um, more steeped in this situation. So it's it's a sick thing. It's a sick thing because as I watch this movie, and this is the sickest part of it, is that just like a fucking villager, the village's voice appears in my head like, this would be very offensive. But that's well, why... Is. Look, I mean, the dialogue is uh, offensive. There's a lot of racial But it's slurs. different, though. Of, uh, it, it's different it's from not. when I was younger. I could watch things that when I was sure, a little younger sure. before this, like, this ideology of, like, this is bad to exist type of thing. Like, it's a different thing beyond, you know, that's the thing. You watch this movie, and yeah, it's supposed to be 
what it is. Like, you're not supposed to say, this is good. The racial slurs, actually, it was good. The point is to be accurate and to show, you know, how people spoke at that time and that it was offensive. And it, it even goes, I think it goes over the top to kind of dramatize this, uh, the way that the culture was so, uh, it was such, it truly is, this this movie. I, unfortunately, I don't think it really does go over the top. Uh, really? But, no, man. I mean, I mean, you I are guess really, you're right. from a different generation. I also, I grew up in a small town in the Midwest. So, like, yeah. you know, like, I don't know what to tell you. I, I've been exposed to more of that. It, it, by, by no means. I mean, yeah, it's, and I'm older. So, yeah, yeah I've heard, I've heard bad words before. <laughs> You know, I, I don't know. Like, that, that's just what... It is what we I, are doing it, now as a yeah. culture. Like, that's where we're at. I, enough. Words. Yeah, I, I, I can't can't humor this anymore. Well, I just think... I, it's, it's a <laughs> thing, because I, I realized, like, I always liked this movie, like, as an idea, but then when I went... Because I had not seen it. I had actually not seen it before covering it for this podcast. And um, it's just... I had seen clips of it, and I, I always thought, oh, that's a good movie. Gotta see it. And then when I sat down to see it, it's a different time now than when I first uh, see, had seen Kubrick movies. And I was like, oh, this is uh, I didn't I didn't recall that it was going to push, you know, the cultural the edge of my cultural um, mores like it does. Because, I mean, there's so many and it, there's a there's something here, though. There's so many layers of cultural difference in this movie. It's not just you know, oh, they're using racial slurs like it's normal. It's very masculine. This movie is very masculine. It's basically all men. And um, there is that sense of, you know, camaraderie between men in battle. That is its own thing. And I can kind of get that. But then there's also war. Being in a battle. That's another layer beyond my experience and my culture, my understanding, that uh, makes it harder for me to relate in a way and then there's just the time the time that it exists there's all these different levels that you have to kind of s find your way through to be able to truly grapple with the human reality of the movie and not get stuck behind it being like this period piece that you watch as kind of an entertainment or something yeah i hear you there actually is one woman in the movie and um, she's the prostitute yeah oh sorry there are <laughs> two there's two a figure if you think about it What's the other one? It's very interesting. It's you, very important that you think about the other. Yeah, it's crucial to the film. It's not the rifle, is it? No. Because they name all the rifles women. That's names. good, though. Uh, that's a good point. <laughs> it's good we're exploring this idea. Um. I mean, the 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 Viet Cong and or NVA soldier at the end is a woman. Oh, my gosh. You're Cessna. right. That's right. Yeah, yeah it's a little girl. That's true. Well, she's not a little girl. I think she's an adult. No, I don't think she's an adult. Whew, she's we are very be canceled. small. I, uh, yeah, I mean, look and look and so look. Here's you're saying should be said. I think it's and a this, kid. Uh, no, it's not a kid. There, there is um, in okay, in Sir Max Hastings' book, <laughs> the <laughs> Vietnam War: An Epic Tragedy, 1945 to 1975, he actually speaks briefly on this theme of the the sense of a physically large American presence going into a, a country that is uh, smaller in both geographical size and also because of whatever reasons, the people tended to be a little bit uh, smaller than the average American for whatever reasons that is, nutrition, I don't know. Uh, and you actually see this in this history book and how he talks about it. And, and you see it in a, a, a very uh, interesting picture of, I believe it's LBJ shaking hands with the South Vietnam um, Prime Minister, Diem, I don't know how to pronounce his name correctly, D-I-E-M, uh, how he towers over him. Mm. And so anyway, so there's so many themes that the one thing that Cooper, I thought, really did well with this film is he, he really touched on so many different themes um uh, in the film and and it, to, to go back to that the idea of uh, offensive racial language and all that there were, there, were, <laughs> there, there were there were serious uh especially towards the end part of the war there were serious uh problems with racial division within the united states army itself with and and, and that was all tied into things that were happening on the domestic front so these things are serious these things are real and um, 
look, these are dark subjects. We shouldn't be, I, I, I in no way want to be mistaken for saying that I'm uh, trivializing any of this. It's that just like with reading history or with watching art and watching film, you better be ready for some heavy things. You better be ready for some darkness. And if you're not, to be fair, it's okay to turn it off and not watch it. Well, here's I the see thing, that. I see that, honestly, because honestly, after the, the, the third Vietnam War we're covering, I'm about ready to uh, go you know, watch a Disney movie. <laughs> I'm about ready to go watch Fast and Furious 8 or whatever. <laughs> That's a little comment, by the way, for that fuckface that um that apologized to China for saying. Uh, oh my God! He, what Mr. is it? Was it John Cena? Oh God! Yeah, I seen him brought it up. It's yes, so embarrassing. Who knows? I mean, this who is knows? again like know. America is an empire in decline. There is a apolo- Didn't he apologize because they said Taiwan existed? Like he said on accident, the country of Taiwan, and God technically, forbid. well, this it's complex. Have a spine, but. John Cena. Why, why, why? Here's the thing, though, and the, the last thing I'm going to say about for this episode, I have to put a thing where we stop about talking about Twitter and cancel culture. Whoa. It has to be a limit. But here's the thing. Um, why would anyone expect the star of a movie called The Fast and Furious 8 to have virtue or a spine? I don't expect they that don't. in the first place. No correct. one does. Correct, correct. But don't be surprised. No, this is the thing disgust, that I just not surprised. Okay, well, this is the thing I do want to... Everybody talks about this thing. They're like, I'm shocked that John Cena... Are you? Are you yeah. shocked are you that really this... Yeah, I'm... A on. rich he's, he's, actor that of you know, shitty movies that was, wasn't even a wrestler. Like, he's not even a real... Like, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it doesn't do matter. I mean, do you want John Cena? No one cares, but it's like, no one's going to pretend that you have a spine either when you do that type of shit. Like, you know, this is the thing. Everybody in their life, you regularly have chances where you can stand for something. And then you get to choose. And you know what? There are people that choose to prioritize their reputation or their profit above other things. And there are consequences for their choices. You may enjoy a life of economic success. Fine. It may be a life that uh, is otherwise not not fruitful. I mean, there's a, you know, it, it reminds me of um, merchants in... Uh, in the like around the I think it was the 14th and the 15th century you would have people that would go between different empires and try to play both sides and they were like the people that prioritized economic gain above ideological allegiance or um, racial ideas because this was a time when it was like oh the Romans are better or oh the the Christians or no Romans or the 14th century no no Romans the 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 Christians Okay. Yes, I agree with you. John yes. Cena. John stop. Cena. But here's the thing. Stop. As those people, when things start to hit the fan, then you or have no John, side. You have John no China. side then. John China. <laughs> More like John China. Uh, whatever. It's fine. Dude, I, I can't wait till that we cover the Fast and Furious 9 on this podcast. I'm sure it has a lot of great... I will uh, commit suicide on live stream. <laughs> no, I can't say that. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> can't even talk about my own suicidal ideation anymore without <laughs> so let's banned. talk about that's not nice you've been blocked <laughs> are we talking about Huey and the Tet Offensive here yes we let's are get into some real history all right people need to know do people need to know a little bit of this and this runs into the journalist idea yeah you need, to, idea. you need to tell us a short history on this a uh, very short I'm going to do this short uh, so the important thing to know and you need to know this a little bit if you want to watch the movie and if you want to understand anything about your own history um, or world history. All right. So the Tet Offensive, I think Tet means, uh, basically it does mean Vietnamese New Year. So the NVA, North Vietnamese Army, it's the Communist Army, along with the Viet Cong Southern Army, but it was actually a pretty big incursion of NVA soldiers, decided there was technically a truce, um, and they decided to do a massive military operation. What this, what this encompassed was... Uh, invading and i don't know the exact number i think it was nearly 60 it may have been more i I could be wrong on that uh regional capitals uh urban centers coming in from the countryside and actually invading cities Uh, this took the americans by surprise even though there was signal intelligence beforehand which they I, i think misread to some degree uh during this time there was a place called Kaesong 
which was they thought the there was a bit, there was an attack there. But anyway, that's getting into the military history stuff. It's probably boring to most people. Point is, Tet Offensive, NVA communist soldiers uh, infiltrated and uh, militarily occupied many cities in, in South Vietnam, including the American embassy in Saigon at one point was actually occupied by essentially a suicide squad because they knew they weren't coming out of that. Um, and, you know, th- so so this this is happening. And then so briefly, I also want to say technically this is a big uh, in terms of the military history and military strategy part, the NVA lost a huge amount of soldiers. It was actually, in some ways, a defeat in a purely military way because the, the, the NVA lost a lot more soldiers than they could really afford to, to lose in some, some ways. But um, in terms of a propaganda victory and a wider victory, it probably was a victory for them because this was the point in the war where uh, Walter Cronkite basically said, it looks like this is going to end in a stalemate. This is the thing called the Cronkite moment where he went on television and, you know, and he, he had actually, he went to Vietnam and reported on this, um, came back. Anyway, Hue is a city that is close to the Da Nang, which was in the, the central highlands part of the country, but which is the northern part of the country of South Vietnam. And this is where this this battle that we're watching in Full Metal Jacket um, ostensibly takes place. So um, the the thing we need to understand about this again is that there were a huge amount of journalists, American, Western, and otherwise, on the ground and reporting. And I, I would encourage everyone who's interested in this to watch all of our podcasts about Vietnam, but also there you can go on YouTube and find this thing. It's a, it's like a 12 part series. Walter Cronkite did later mm. after the war was over. It's probably available on video cassette as well. <laughs> uh, they say that at the end of every program is available on video cassette. So this would have been probably made in the, this I'm guessing the eighties or something. Um, I can't remember exactly, but if you want to see real on the ground reporting of a war, it's um, it's stunning how different it is from what happens later in, in our um, in reporting on the wars that are more our lifetime, like the I think Gulf War. That Gulf War, not so much for you, but the no. Second Gulf War, however you like. I I that was one thing that I I noticed about the movie. Um, there's an element of Full Metal Jacket that is specifically dealing with media. Which makes sense for a director, a filmmaker, to be uh, more aware of not just war as it's as it is on its own, but also the other aspects of war that have to do with documentation. And um, this movie, when I saw the part where there is um, there's actual journalists. There's there's one scene where they show towards the end where there's journalists right there in a battlefield, going along with the camera and then interviewing the soldiers while they're in the battlefield essentially, and um, that struck me as so weird, and I thought that was so interesting how during that time. Because you hear the Vietnam War, and it doesn't sound like we're talking about World War One or something. It doesn't sound like some archaic thing that you would say, oh, things are so different now. But they really, truly are almost unrecognizable when it comes to how war is done in many different ways, not just media. But um, the media is one of the strange things that has changed so drastically, and no one really cares. We don't really care that the media coverage of war has been shrunk to nothing but a kind of uh, indulgence where it's, okay, we're going to take you on a field trip journalist. We'll show you the approved areas. I mean, before, and, and it makes you think because there's some, there's very specific things that have to happen here for that to be okay. So think about in that scene in Vietnam there, that's in public land. Okay, there's no reason why someone can't walk into public land. Right. But that's not how it is now. Now, something has to have changed where 
it doesn't the wherever the military is where there's an uh, a, an ongoing battle it's no longer it, it's like the jurisdiction of the land changes so now it's not a person can just walk in with a camera now it is its own secure space and you're and the, any filmmaking any documentation has to be approved and has to go through all this bureaucracy um as opposed to previously where you just I mean, of course, there was press passes and things like that, but it wasn't constricted and, and heavily overseen the way it is now. I mean, yeah, I don't I you know, there are, I'm sure, very specific things. And I'm sure journalists could tell us more about this, how it works, because I don't I don't know. I, there's so many different factors here. I mean, you have different factors like for in Vietnam, number one, we South Vietnam for journalists was a place where they could be in v- stationed in various different cities. You know, I'm not sure that, and again, I, I want to make it clear I'm kind of speculating here. I'm sure there are journalists who would say I'm wrong and that they know a lot better. But like, so take, you know, the, the Iraq War, the second version. Um, you know, journalists weren't going to go hang out for long periods of time in other cities besides the Green Zone in Baghdad, partially because I'm not sure how safe they would be to do that. Whereas in occupied South Vietnam, uh, you know, yes, there's danger, but it was, this is complex. It's a little bit, it's a little bit probably my guess would be that as a journalist, you would have felt given the time period, uh, like you could operate outside, like inside the city of way, uh, not, not withstanding the Tet offensive. Um, as opposed to a journalist who would say go to Fallujah and just hang out at the Fallujah Hilton. I don't know if that exists. Do you know what I'm saying? So there's some there's some aspect of this is maybe infrastructure and the different country and the different uh, types of conflict. Uh, part of it is actually the different type of conflict. Uh, you know, at the height in Vietnam, I think we had over half a million soldiers in the country. Um, I'm not sure what the height of uh, military presence in, say, Iraq was or Afghanistan, but I, I know in Afghanistan it had to be quite a bit lower than that. So there, there's different things, but yes, there there was. The military understood after this, after Vietnam. They understood that there was a price to be paid to allowing um, unfettered access in a war zone, and they were not wrong. I mean, they, they are not totally wrong. If you look at it in a very cold and objective way, if your side is giving, you know, and and I support this, by the way, but still, if your side is giving open access to journalists in Vietnam, it's not like the communist North Vietnamese army are also giving their journalists open access to, to, you know, figure out what's going on there. That's not real. They don't do that. Now, that's what makes our country better. I have no problem saying that. I like that better. I like the fact that journalists are allowed to be free. I I I privilege that over uh, communist authoritarian journalism. Call me what you want. You know, look, I'm not going to be making Fast and Furious number ten, obviously, from these comments. <laughs> you know, I'm and but. I yep. think it's better. That being said, it does have some downsides because, cool. you know, the, the communists aren't uh, tracking their own war crimes, whereas American journalists are like, you know, actually doing real reporting. Anyway, I just really encourage anyone to go, you know, you don't have to watch a 12-part series from the 80s about Vietnam War. That's my job, and I'll bring you the info. But you really should go check out some of this reporting. It's just, it's, it's, um, and these are names that became famous later. Dan Rather, I believe, was there. Walter Cronkite, obviously a, a big name. Uh, I want to say, yeah, I don't want to say something factually incorrect. But anyway, there, there are big, big journalists that went there and did the work. Yeah, it's a strange it should be, thing because we even have, um, I don't know. I think there's, uh, it, it, wa- watching that part of uh, of the movie, there's also the very on purpose aspect of the film that has to do with the the newspaper the start what is it stars and stripes that the main character is on 
on a, on the newspaper. But that's and the military's newspaper. The, it yeah. circulates and within it's propaganda. the military. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And and it, it's it, propaganda. It's interesting because there's one scene when he goes to speak to one of the other soldiers on a different area. And um, the soldier is first like very suspicious of him and is like, what are you doing? What, what is what is your deal? Like, who are you with? And then he's like, oh, I'm for the newspaper on the base. And he's like, oh, OK. Yeah. It's like posing and taking pictures and it's sure. completely changed. It's like, well, actually, we've killed a bunch of people and we've done this. And blah, blah. it's to the total demeanor changes because now he knows what context the information is going to be in and it's not going to be um, disparaging. But so there's that idea that um, the difference between, you know, the free press and then what's going to be heavily edited and and or you know twisted to make sure that it's are going to be going to an audience that's going to be receptive to it um and can i say i, I actually want to say something also about this um and i'm not an expert on this but you know what there are reporters even today and they should be saluted they should be they go to war zones and try to cover and do real journalism and some a lot of them have died in war zones, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria, and other places. So I actually want to take a moment and not just say, oh, the only good reporting in war zones was the Vietnam War. That's not true. There, there, there is, and there are people that have sacrificed their lives to, to get stories. What I, I, I think the difference is, is that you saw Walter Cronkite's on CBS. It's a major, major network channel. And my sense anyway, and it's just my sense I could be wrong. My sense anyway is that you don't see that as much over the last 20 years on uh, in a lot of the in a lot of the major you know uh, no. networks but the, it exists i mean this isn't a black Not and white or all or nothing networks. i mean who are they it's at this point it, we know let's be honest we know that if you have information that's gonna strongly contradict the position of one of the major networks because it's not an accident that all their media seems to all flow towards the same story i mean no one no one even gets their news from these channels like cnn and whatever else you're getting fox or something i mean if you do you're probably like above 50 years old or you're watching it with some passing curiosity most people are getting their news online from publications and from social media. A lot of people get their news from social media, which is very concerning. Um, I'm not sure which one is more concerning. But well, one thing I will grant uh, Twitter and social media is that it, it strangely allows for on the ground reporting uh, in the too. moment. Yeah, actual footage of what's happening in places where a lot of reporters are just you know, it's not it's not it's not an indictment on the bravery of per, uh, personal bravery of reporters. I th a lot of it is economic. I think a lot of these large media uh, companies simply know that it's more cost effective. Like, you know, and I've heard this complaint before. You know, what are you going to do? Send you know, the, 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 the rate of return for sending and funding, which costs a decent amount of money, a journalist to go and live in Iraq you know, when when you could pay some intern to write uh, an article about, you know, whether uh, whatever bullshit headline of the day about cancel culture or about, you know, uh, it doesn't matter that like you pay someone eight dollars an hour to write that article. Mm -hmm. Or do you do you spend hundreds of thousands of dollars supporting a journalist to go live in Iraq and do reporting? And I well, think some of this happens. is economics. It's, it's, it's no more. Happens, I don't think though. that it's a conspiracy. I guess what I'm trying to say. I don't think it's necessarily conspiratorial. I don't think I think it's a failure. Well, I, but I think, think it's conspiratorial that also. So here's the thing. I think there's two elements to this. I don't think it's an accident that certain things are reported and others are not. Like, I don't think it's an accident sure. that the New York Times has developed a preoccupation with finding racism and everything from crocheting to, you know, Disney movies or whatever. Uh, that's not those are choices that are made. And there is an economic incentive, though, which you describe. But here's the thing. That's why no one reads the fucking New York Times, because when you are churning out garbage for clickbait instead of putting in the investment to do real journalism that's accurate, that's informative, that's unique, that's effortful, then that's what you get back. You're yeah, going to get you know, back passing interest. You're not going to be a, an esteemed institution like it once was. It, it, okay, so uh, I'm not a huge fan of the New York Times, but they still do put some money into some 
more in-depth reporting. So I don't want to, again, I don't want to be all black and white about this and all like, I, I don't. I think there's nuance to all this. But, you know, yeah, I'm trying to recall. every now and then the New York Times does something right, sure. But I mean, it's on ch- average, it, it's pretty, like, embarrassing. I don't even want to write for an organization like that. Like, I thought about it. And then I was like, you know what? I don't. I don't want to be associated with an organization well, you can, like that. You don't need to think about it anymore. You forget about that from what you've already said on this podcast. But well, anyway, there you so go. <laughs> so it's done. That's done. But you know, I'm trying to remember. I'm trying to recall because there was. Um, the, and this is kind of important. You know, we this is going to be a two part thing because we're obviously oh, just man. speculating and ranging yeah. wildly. But um, there was a important story that was done in the 70s or 80s with regard to investigative journalism that had to do with corruption at the local level in Chicago. And I remember this was an NPR thing I heard before the pandemic. NPR was another one that used to do real things on the regular. Okay, that's the difference is that, yeah, NPR still does things real every now and then. They make an effort and they get things right. But it's like every time I turn on the radio, it's like why Latinxes are maybe not happy about clothes that are the color blue. Like it's just absolute drivel. It's It's gotten worse in the last two years. And and, uh, and look, I'm going to be honest. I've simply stopped. I've stopped listening. To yeah, a lot too. of that, but anyway, I mean, what I was going to say, this was before. This is a couple of years ago, and this, yeah. my point was, they were talking about a story that uh, I think I assume that the big paper in Chicago, which I don't know what that is. Sorry, uh, Chicagoans, if that's the name of people from Chicago. Um, but in the seventies, they did this, and it cost a lot of money. And the whole the NPR report about this story was that it cost a lot of money. It was it was really good long-term investigative journalism what they did was they actually set up they essentially purchased a bar and then they set up a thing where they were finding out how corrupt the city inspectors were how you could essentially bribe them and all that so but it costs a lot of money to do this these stories and afterwards um if i recall correctly this was this was a problem because they spent so much money doing it but it you know, That's a th- there's a you know what here's here's what I want to say, more, less specifically, more broadly, we have a responsibility as readers and consumers of media to ask for and to require of the journalist to do a good job. We can't you can't keep look we can't keep clicking on the thing about is yeah. John Cena uh, apologizing to Ch- we can't keep on. We can't keep on. This is then. This comes to the fundamental well, reason why NPR. I try. That's what this happens. Is, no, but this is why I, I so oftentimes you you're always. Uh, I'm always more reticent to talk about like these kinds of um, current events or the thing that is in the news today. And I yeah, you know, I did it today with the John Cena guy or whatever. Uh, but because I feel like I feel like that there entering into the dialogue with it clicking it uh even if you're like on the other side of it you're somehow feeding the beast you're somehow feeding the machine of 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 triviality you're you're of 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 this frivolous well, I mean, there's a discussion. Problem. It's tough. At the same it's tough time, to... you are in your own culture. You know, you are in your culture. Here's what I don't want. I don't want NPR to tell me why crocheting is racist. I don't want the New York Times to tell me why the Jungle Book is sexist or whatever. I don't, I don't want, you know, a reporter at the New York Times uh, saying this person said a bad word. I don't fucking care. You are having a degree in journalism. You are supposed to actually do the real work. We're making a podcast about movies. So if we want to talk about why some celebrity is a fool for capitulating to a communist oppressive regime because they want to make Fast and the Furious 2009, that's different. You know, there's different standards here. Uh, we're there not is. a journalistic outlet. You know, so <laughs> we are I, not. I don't we are mind not. Uh, we talking We should put that on record right culture. now. I mean, to put that on record right now, we are not a journalistic outlet. I mean, but the New York Times and NPR are. And here's the other thing. NPR is well-funded. NPR is funded by lots of people all over the country. And NPR has been funded uh, publicly for ever. I mean, that's the whole thing. It's publicly funded. So Yeah, but I think uh, isn't, I don't know. The, the, the specifics, I don't know. Because their funding is 
my understanding, maybe it's PBS. It's only a small percentage of it is publicly funded. Yeah, well, but that's more I, than I, private. That's more than private journalism. So sure, I mean, sure, You would sure. imagine I don't that know. they're having a little bit of a better chance at pursuing things uh, without having to be entirely profit driven. But here, I'm not going to say I'm not going to talk about the economic everything that's regarding to publications. But I mean, you have to decide as a as a as a person. Also, this is this is the thing. Yeah, sure. Um, whatever you can. Sh- again, that's the John Cena thing. You want to pursue f- economic gain instead of integrity. OK, then you make garbage. That's what happens. Yeah, you have some money and you get to have a longer career, but it's a boring, well, vapid career. And it doesn't this, create any good change, any lasting thing. I mean, NPR is not doing... Uh, NPR used to be really informative, really interesting. I loved NPR. I yeah, can't listen to it now. It's a joke. Every time I turn it on, it's like, why fat people are taking over the world? Like, who fucking cares? This is... What is this? 24-7 radio about every ism and every new little cultural issue that you can dig up under the sun? Like, why chairs are racist? Like, truly... It's ridiculous. But here's the thing. You're capitalizing on a p- social panic. So you're going to get what you rot from that. You know, I mean, if, if you're trying to s- sell cheap items, then you have, you know, a, a, a cheap business model. I don't that's I mean, it, it's, it's again, living by principles, having integrity and an institution is the same thing. An institution can be uh, weak. And then what happens to weak institutions is that they crumble and both of us do not fund NPR anymore because of that. I was happy to, I've donated to NPR periodically before. And I, you know, now, no. I actually still like PBS. And I, I PBS uh, tries. PBS, PBS seems to be. P- it's, 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 again, a, it's not a black and white thing. And all I could tell you, my own personal, the way I'm dealing with it, is that if I don't like something, if I don't think that it's, making me better, making me think, challenging me to do something, if I think that it's frivolous, I turn it off and let, I can't believe I'm going to say this, let the market do its work. (laughs) (laughs) I can't believe I'm going to say it, but you know, like at at some, at some point, I don't know. uh, uh, But the problem is that there's a new ethos because these things are online now. So they're tapping into a cheap fuel, which is outrage. Well, let them have it. It, Look, these, we, Everyone intrinsically, and everyone in, everyone in a very deep level knows what how this ends up. Yeah. If well, you, if yeah. you make if you make garbage, then you you get what you deserve. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that's the that's the the motto for this podcast. You get what you deserve. <laughs> it's honestly, I mean that's the thing because if you if you traffic in outrage, well, who is your customer base then? People that are constantly outraged and, and looking to be outraged. And so the problem is tomorrow you get a story wrong, you lose half your customer base because they're boycotting everything in the world to have a sense of meaning in their life. So it's again, you know, live by values or live by the sword. You get to choose also how you die. The end. I'm going to exactly. And I'm going to boycott my own podcast until I get the word of the podcast at the very beginning of it. That's not going to happen. It's not it's not a good <laughs> intro. You can't do it. Anyway, the one last thing I, I did, I, I like to bring up in regards to media on this is that, like you said, um, the communist army was not documenting their war crimes and there's something interesting that i've been thinking about which is in a democracy with free media and uh, free information there is a cost to that and it's an interesting one because here we learn so much about what our country has done wrong we tally all the war crimes we teach um all the the atrocities we teach our history and all the mistakes that that history has included but authoritarian regimes don't do that they don't do that they gloss uh, uh, let me they don't gloss over it they erase it from history so i mean whether it's cuba or it's china or I mean, North Korea is another great example of what how far you can go with a regime deciding that free information is not important. And what's actually important is to create an image of the country as a uh, utopianistic and prevailing and and, uh, and, perf- and perfect. And so we easily say like, oh, free information is the best. We should know uh, about our country, everything that our country does. But at the same time, is there a danger or rather, I think there is a danger in being so open with covering a country's errors and mistakes is that 
it seems actually like you end up with a population that's being med led astray by other countries lack of free information so here if you're an american you can very easily recount all the atrocities all the mistakes all the horrible things that your own country has done but you're not going to be so easily able to recall all the atrocities and the errors that authoritarian regimes have uh, done, unless they're so particularly egregious that you learn about them in your own uh, country's education, which we do on some level, but not that much. I mean, we learn about American history, and we learn an American history that's full both the mistakes and the positives. Morally, the, mostly the mistakes is what I remember from my education at this point, which is fine. I'm not saying I want to be indoctrinated, but do is there a risk then that you have a population that actually turns against its own country because it says, look at all these horrible things we do. We're doing all these horrible things without realizing that actually the other forms of government just have erased those horrible things. They're not teaching them. So I think there's an interesting thing in that, that kind of... Um, danger of free coverage is that i mean you learn so much about what your country does wrong and it's up to you in a way to make sure you balance the scale by going out and seeking the information about what other things have done wrong too because if not i don't think the american system does a good job of fairly educating on all those uh different different systems Things tend to change over time. I mean, it certainly wasn't the case in America that we always uh, looked back and looked at the, the the negative things that we've done and the problems we've done. And it's it's to be fair, even today, I'm sure there are uh, <laughs> to pretend like that we live in some moment where there are no crimes committed that we just don't know about yet would be naive. So, is there a danger? Yes. There is, but it's more of a challenge because I still believe it to be the best thing. If if we don't look and face the problems in our society and in our history and in the way things work, they will never be able to fix anything. That, so I, I totally endorse that and I'm, I'm for it. You do need to balance that with understanding history, with understanding other regimes, other forms of government in the, in the world and what they've done. You need to balance it with that. You also need to not judge people by today's standards that lived 500 years ago because that makes that just simply makes zero sense. That does, doesn't make sense. You need to do that. And then you also have to understand that uh, <clears throat> this is the best system. It, it, it's just a painful system. Mm -hmm. and But that's what makes it good is that, yeah, you— it's good that we're able to look at the things we've done wrong and to debate them and to talk about them and then to fix them. Because if you don't know what's wrong, you can't fix it. Now, what you're saying is also true, though, that if you get so overbalanced to the point where all you see is the negative about your own country and, and uh, then, then, then you're not going to help anything. I mean, if that's the point, if the point is to try to make things better, which I still believe in, I still believe in that idea of you make things better in your country if possible. That sounds, uh, it, it, me saying that sounds, it sounds like, I, it sounds odd to me. Like it sounds, uh, but I believe that still. I don't, I think most people still do believe that. I, I, I don't know. That's, that's what I believe. So yeah, there's a danger to it, but that's your responsibility. Take responsibility. I mean, Learn. that's that's the, the interesting thing about um, the democracy in the form that we have it is that it really does place a lot of work on the individual. But the thing is that it it's it's the cost of freedom. You know, that's that's what it is, is that you have to do the work for yourself. You have to um, you don't get indoctrinated. 
and, and as much as people love to say, oh, the American system indoctrinates, it's like, no, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. It has to teach it does, you something. It does a bit. It I mean, does it has a to bit. Take it has information to. and give it to you. Like, there's. Sure. You're, you can be homeschooled. You can take up issue with the lectures and you can you can bring uh, problems against the, the lessons that you're being taught. I mean, it's not even like anything is set in stone. I mean, you have today, currently, the. Uh, pu- public schooling education is being ripped apart by trying to have different ideas taught in it and whether we should be teaching um, whatever these these politics of the day or we should be doing this. I mean, public school education and just education in general at the, at the grade school level is constantly being tinkered with. So, I mean, just by that nature, it's not this type of like totalitarian indoctrination system. And so... There, but well, to some degree, to some degree, it is literally state sponsored. It is a state sponsored school that has a set of beliefs that they are telling children. So, it, by definition, to some degree, well, anything, beliefs is a, a choice of words there because math is, is a belief, is. you know, like there's you, well, you others you'd would have argue, to decide how, yeah, or find them on Twitter, would argue, yeah, they would. Yeah. You'd have to decide. I mean, at that point, you can have no education that doesn't. There's a there. There's a problem there where it's well, it's we're unable to teach people without indoctrinating them, which I don't think is true. I think if you um, if you teach through a certain framework rather than trying to just impose information and a worldview, which I'm sure there are individual teachers or even schools that uh, do that and that there's a problem with that. And I would say that I'm not, this is by no means saying that our education system is brilliant at all. I think it's a mess, but uh, I don't think it's as perfectly organized, some conspiracy that there's some cohesive attempt to indoctrinate people. I mean, go you know, check out the lesson plans in any type of authoritarian country, and then you can see what the fuck the difference is. This is. I not- think the only the only solution to this, in my in my view, is to allow for questioning and allow for skepticism. And that, yeah. if that's allowed, which it is for the most part, though I'm a little concerned right now uh, how much it's being dampened down. But as long as it's allowed, you'll have a kind of self correcting system, mm-hmm. so that <clears throat> whatever power structures may be indoctrinating this or that you know as long as you have this freedom to question it the individual or that's a student citizen whatever the parent, person well, who lives yeah. here uh then we're safe-ish like yeah. we can work it out we can we can balance it out this is but this is the look this is the belief that's founded on enlightenment principles and and concepts of reason and things and there is a school of thought which we which we know postmodernism, which doesn't even it doesn't agree with my basic assumptions of this so you know that yeah. that is what it is but i i, I i'm sticking to this so because because it's kind of worked it hasn't worked great a lot I mean, it's been worked a lot better of- than everything else so there's that I mean, what other alternative systems do you have to a democracy? Uh, uh, I well, mean, we can argue the 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 smaller details, like we should have socialized health care or something. Yeah, sure, whatever. But that's not, you know, you can't, you can still have a democracy and you still have to have the ability for diverse viewpoints, for constant questioning, for pushback and debate. That's, you know, I'm happy to have all the ideas as long as I can criticize and question all of them. But, you know, so, it's the responsibility of me and you and anyone else to you have a resp- you don't just have a right to free speech you don't just have a right to this unless you defend your own right by by pushing back on things yeah you have to do it you can't just sit around and be a coward and not say anything because you're afraid that uh, people on twitter are going to yell at you you can't do it and honestly yeah. if you do you kind of deserve to be subjugated so yeah. you know i mean like that's a surf. Those- that sounds a bit harsh, but you know, except if you if you wish to accept your subjugation, then go ahead and do it. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, and well, w- with with the with, the with the understanding that everybody's different, people are people are afraid. People get concerned. People are afraid. I understand that, but you know, yeah. I, don't know what I to mean, say. at the end of the a, day, you have to. There's an element where you don't want um, people to be... We can't have a system where every single person has to be a hero. I don't think that that's sustainable. But I do think that um, in a system where the individual has so much freedom, you do have a duty not to become a miniature dictator. And I think the problem is that there's an ethos of authoritarianism that is inherent in human beings. They want to subjugate themselves to something and they want to subjugate other people oftentimes. And so... 
if you lose touch with what it means to be a free individual and what it requires to be a free individual, then you are not one. And then you are one more piece, uh, one, one other cog in the machine that is an authoritarian system. I mean, the, the true, you know, kind of uh, malevolence of authoritarianism, I think, is that it's not really just some, some type of system that gets imposed on people. A true authoritarian, authoritarianism seems to be um, enforced by its own people. You know, if you think of uh, like communist regimes, it's it's always there's always an element of the population that becomes an arm of the regime. They start to self censor. They start to censor others and to look around and it becomes this self perpetuating system. And because authoritarianism is a kind of psychology, it's a mentality. I mean, it is one of a person that wants to subjugate themselves to something higher and that's it's a scary thing because there is something inherent in the human being that wants something bigger than it the hope is that you find that thing for yourself um instead of making it the state previously it was deities previously it was kings uh but now you know there is there is not that. You don't have a deity that is larger than you that rules over you or a king. So I think a lot of people still, you know, they don't know how to replace that gaping hole where something larger than them used to be. So they replace it with an ideology. And that's inherently authoritarianism. I mean, whether it's fascism or communism, replacing something larger that rules over you with the state is authoritarian. Yeah, I don't know that it's that at the moment that it's the state. It seems to be this. It is this desire just to conform to certain standards of language and behavior, which weren't even the standards five years ago. So, That's and the I, 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 it's but, the people. But yeah, so That's the scary you, thing. It's. I still believe that it is a small amount of people driving yeah. that, and then it's a larger mm -hmm. amount of people that that accept it. And then there's a huge amount of people just don't even think about it or know that it's really occurring. Uh, and then there's a very small amount of people that will stand up to it. But it's enough because if you have a small enough people, small enough amount of people that will stand up to it, you'll see very soon that the people that are actually driving the project is a pretty small amount of people too. Yeah. I, it's 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 odd. Um, I could speak to some specific things that I actually – I had a teacher – professor who was Romanian and she told us during a class one time told a story about how she had been denounced by the communist party in Romania you know as a teacher and and this kind of shame se session or whatever that she had to go through and endure and you know where she was surrounded by her colleagues and um I don't know the specifics of what she did or why she was accused of this or that. I don't recall or know, and she may not have even told us. But and and I remember, and this was only you know, not too long ago. And I remember thinking how bizarre that was, and how like how oh that could never happen. Uh, and I I don't know what to say, but it's it it is happening. Yeah, here. I mean those are the Chinese struggle sessions too that happened during the sure. Cultural Revolution. And I mean, it does happen here because now you're having some uh, corporations, you know, some businesses where you have all these like diversity, equity, inclusion people. That's just like an industry that popped up overnight and suddenly is making like, those people make like seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 working on universities and working in with a, with organizations and so there are certain programs where all the white people go into a room and they talk about how bad and how wrong it is that they're white or all the men go into a room and talk about how wrong it is that they are men I mean at this point I just like I know that the problem is that human beings are collectivists, like in a way that human beings are naturally collectivist animals. We want to be accepted by our group. It's terrifying to stand up against a group because historically that likely meant you were going to die. If you were expelled from your tribe, your group, 
you could die or you could be executed, whether it was not that you were left out in the wilderness. So I mean, but this is where I, this is where, look again, uh, you know, if you live in communist Romania and that's happening to you, I get it. Maybe you need to say what you need to say to stay out of the prison camp. But yeah. for any American, for any American to sit there and, and subject themselves to such, uh, to such things, they get what they deserve. You're because you're not going to if you're H. Yeah, you may get fired, I guess. Yeah. But like the stakes, if the, if your inability to stand up for yourself with the stakes being so low in a free, prosperous country, then, you know, I, I mean, really like I. It's scary because you you see the you see what happens though is that people don't understand that the stakes are low because they feel high for them. And it's that idea that problems our problems expand to fill the space that we have for them. So suddenly job loss or ostracism by your colleagues that you don't really like anyway becomes the biggest threat, becomes a terror to you. And, and you know, when 100 years ago, that would have been firing squads that we would talk about. and Or in some places it is still. But you have to that's where perspective is so important and it's the idea to realize that the stakes only get higher they don't get lower if you're not going to you know stand by your principles or stand for yourself when you feel like the stakes are high why would the stakes magically get lower that's not how that works you just like with everything like with any individual situation you decide what you accept from another person you decide what you accept from your culture from an institution from your country and so if you accept being treated like some type of uh you know prisoner or some type of second class citizen or like you're living in an actual authoritarian regime then that's what you get so you know no good let's move on though we've got coming up chaos versus order i think that's going to be an excellent topic for the second part of no, full metal jacket too long? I believe that I believe that we should. Uh, it's such a broad. I mean, I think that it's a big subject. It is a big uh, subject. So, you know, that's my that's my. Um, OK, I think we'll have to make it here. into two parts because yeah. uh, we've done <laughs> we've done done enough disparaging the media. <laughs> I think the name of this uh, episode should be. What's your major malfunction, numb nuts? <laughs> Uh, a, a letter to John Cena. Oh my God! <laughs> is it Cena? He, the guy might it's be a nice John person. Cena. I have no, I have no, no, no I'm idea. Sure he's I know a nice nothing person, of but him. But just like yeah. Nietzsche says, no one gives a fuck if you're a nice person. Be a strong. person. That's what person. he said. That's a quote. <laughs> no one gives a fuck if you're a nice person. I don't know, man. I never seen the Fast and the. We'll 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 uh, end this with just some with some uh, freestyle. And I've never I've never seen the Fast and the Furious one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I haven't seen any of that. It's about cars racing each other or something. Uh, and I don't know John Cena. Maybe he's a great, great person. Uh, I, I I don't know. It, it's just like I under like I can understand the people that are afraid to stand up. For, for what they think or believe if they have ramifications. I understand the small the small people. I, I understand the, people. the small ones who are out there who are, you know, being lambasted by their HR representative at AT&T because they work at a call center for $9 an hour. I get it. Like, I get it. What What is disgusting to me is a multimillionaire who will do that just for more money. Yeah. And you know what? I really do. Again, I really don't like to specifically I, I really don't. I really don't like to specifically call out or speak to, to individuals because I think these are broader things. But like I can't. I just have no respect for that. Well, I mean, you know, it's an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment. You're an American and you're enjoying all the freedoms and the resources and the wealth. Are we that sure he's an American? Brought? What if he's not an American? That's a good point. Sure. Maybe he's from Canada <laughs> or something. No, I think he's an American. It's John Cena. Isn't he a, I, he's a, I isn't he a wrestler? I assume, yeah, it's, okay. American professional wrestler. Yeah, if he was exactly. Canadian, I'd give him a pass. Yeah, they don't That's understand true. freedom as well. <laughs> they don't understand. He was born in Massachusetts. So, you know. I don't know what that means. 
Maybe a northerner. <laughs> That's not a northerner. Just Massachusetts is known for being extremely um, repressed or something. Extremely liberal. Oh, well, whatever. I mean, enjoy you know liberal Massachusetts when no, let me not. I'm just gonna stop. Yeah, I'm just, just, just stop leave myself. John Cena alone. I let him wrestle with cars or whatever he does. <laughs> you know, it, everyone. And again, all this stuff, everyone will forget in a week or two. But you know, he won't. He'll have to live for he the. Won't. I'm really getting down. I can't. I keep trying to stop, but then I keep thinking about it, and I'm he like, he has to live with I himself. Can, well, but look, there are people like. I've I mean, been it's to embarrassing. China. I don't. I. 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 I I don't Who know apologizes to the CCP? Like, are you a lot of joking? People. Yeah, well, he's not standing in front of a firing squad. Like, you're on American soil. You are free. And you are acting like you are the citizen of an authoritarian country for a few extra bucks. Like, get a fucking spine. I have no, it's an embarrassment. These are the people that are supposed to represent our country. They're public figures. They make entertainment. They make media. And that's what they do. You know, capitulate to a country that attacks your own country. It's already been seen. The, China has already been, you know, incriminated in uh, cyber attacks and constantly stealing, you know, copyright information. It's probably stealing that movie right out from under you, John Cena. Not even going to get the money. You're gonna, it's going to be, you know, botched over there, sold counterfeit. I that's, mean, an interesting, that's an interesting point, though, actually, because... Uh, well, we're really going off into a lot of different it. subjects, but <laughs> no, no, no. But I mean, that has been. I mean, again, I've been in China. Um, certainly, they. Um, it's interesting. I wonder what the specifics of the economics are because I think that those movies do well in the theater, like you know, in the in the actual movie theaters there. Um, uh, Not well uh, enough to be know, a spineless. Well, and the man's fool. making. I, I assume millions and millions of dollars and fine but and he needs a few million more that's the thing that's the just CCP, so then God that's the thing that's it. just that's what's disgusting about it is that like to know to know and understand that there are people in china actually you know that's i don't want to i'm not i've done enough american good stuff for a second let me let me put this a different way there's a bunch of people chinese citizens chinese human beings that have been tortured and massacred by the government that that man's apologizing to. So yep. forget about the idea that because you're an American, maybe you ought to maybe you ought to stick up a little bit and and stick up for at least what you said. And hey, if you said it on accident, fair enough. If there's some nuance to what you want to correct, fine. That's fine. But there are Chinese people who live in China that are tortured by their own government, and you're apologizing to that government so you can make more money about a movie that's garbage. That's about fast cars. Like, it just, you know, it's an embarrassment. I mean, this is why I say we are an empire in decline. You have, there's no denying that we are no, an but, empire but, but, in decline. That's what I'm trying to get person. away from, though. It's that the forget about the American aspect of it. I'm saying that he has a responsibility to people in China who are abused by their own government not to apologize to that, for, to that government. Forget about can't. it. If he's like... If he's like, oh, America is stupid. I, 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 I like China. Okay, fine. But then you need to understand that that government is it does terrible things to their own citizens. If for nothing else, for the people of China, you know, this have some respect is the for yourself. Psychology of a person who bows to authoritarianism. That is exactly the person because <laughs> it requires that you have principles to say We're you really know. Really going what? after old I, John. <laughs> John. <laughs> what if he's one of what if he's one of our only Patreons? He's yeah. like he writes us a letter and he's like, Well, I'm not I'm not subscribing to your Patreon anymore. Because I have principles, I would say, see you later, buddy. That's it. Like that's how that works. I have no problem. I've been you know, poor before, I'll be poor again. Um, it's not a problem. I mean, I'm not, I'm not even rich now. So let's let no one be confused that our one patron or whatever is, you know, we're living in a golden mansion or something. This is not, it's, it doesn't matter. I mean, that's why in a way religion was such a useful thing for people was because it gave them an, a logic by which to live for principles because the idea the story was well you stand for these principles no matter no matter what because even if they don't give you short-term gain they give you long-term gain i have i have a solution to this that will make everybody happy all right hear me out 
John Cena should convert to Islam. He should become a Muslim, so he'll have religion now, which is a foundation for moral values. Then he should move to Western China as a Muslim and make the Fast and the Furious 9 there. In the that's my, camps. That's my, I don't they think should... it's called Uyghur, but oh, yes, Uyghur, in those camps. Uyghur. Uyghur. It's okay. Whatever. It's disputed. The, the it's not it's Uyghur, Muslim. I think. Uyghur. Okay. Yes. Yes. Got it. The, the the least I can do is get the name right of the people. Yeah, that please. Are being, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you need to apologize. Yeah, so he can cast them apology. in the Fast and the Furious 200. Yeah, it and it can, can be, be about cars driving can be through about, the Uyghur camps. Yeah, it could be about cars doing laps race. around the concentration camps. And, and then China will love it because it'll yeah. see see the Uyghur camps. Actually, it's just the Fast and the Furious set. That's what That's right. the Uyghurs are doing. Yeah. is filming the Fast and the Furious 200. That's right. It's just a big on-set it's location. It's just a giant set that they can't <laughs> leave because we're mass-producing the Fast and the Furious constantly. So That's why right. would we, we let them more. leave? That's you right. know, it's just jobs. They're it's just, just jobs. Just, they're just making jobs. It's yeah. fine. Thanks, John so Cena. I think this